Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and this will be the first part in the series on how to progress hypertrophy training. And in this video, we will cover what progressive overload is and how this applies to hypertrophy training. Before we delve into how trainees can progress hypertrophy training, we first need to understand what exactly hypertrophy is. Hypertrophy in the most simple sense refers to an increase in muscle size. We won't get into the details of the different types of hypertrophy as it is not really relevant for this video. However, the main factor to understand is that hypertrophy is a structural adaptation, not a performance outcome. This means we are after growth of the muscle tissue. We aren't necessarily chasing improvements in lifting performance. Hypertrophy training is often misinterpreted as strength training where the goal is to lift the most amount of weight possible. So rather than trying to lift the most weight possible, we are trying to stress the muscle as much as possible. This is important to understand and will be relevant for the rest of this video series when we discuss progression for hypertrophy training. Now that we understand the basic concept of hypertrophy training, we also need to understand the concept of progressive overload. Progressive overload in the most simple sense refers to making training more difficult over time. This is a universal principle for all training adaptations and is essential to see long-term improvements in any form of training. From a simplistic point of view, the principle works like this. First, we train in some capacity to provide a stimulus that is geared towards improving some sort of adaptation. This stresses the relevant tissues and systems, which causes a disruption to homeostasis. This means we have something that interrupts the state of balance our body is currently in. As a result, the body aims to get back to homeostasis by repairing the damage caused by the disruption. Furthermore, provided that the stimulus was sufficiently disruptive, there will also be a supercompensation effect, where the body will adapt to a greater capacity than the previous baseline level. So once we recover, we are actually in a more robust physiological state to handle that stress once again. This basic relationship is known as the general adaptation syndrome. If this adaptation cycle continues to occur, then we will end up with significant long-term adaptations in whatever we are training for. So now that we understand the general concept of progressive overload, we will now explore how this applies specifically to hypertrophy training. Progressive overload is somewhat difficult to quantify for hypertrophy training compared with other performance outcomes. This is because the stimulus for hypertrophy is simply muscle stress induced by resistance training. So unlike performance outcomes, the principle of specificity doesn't apply to hypertrophy training. This is because the muscle can be stressed in many different ways and achieve equivalent muscle growth. For hypertrophy training, the ultimate form of progressive overload is to increase muscle stress over time. Generally, trainees want to increase total work performed by the muscle over time as a form of progressive overload. This means increasing load lifted and reps performed over time to provide a greater training stress to the muscle. However, while this makes sense in theory, we also need to consider the practical implementation of this principle. Remember, the only reason we want an increase in lifting performance is to increase stress to the muscle. Therefore, we should never reduce muscle stress in other ways for the sake of increasing performance. There are a number of factors which may influence lifting performance which don't directly impact muscle stress. First is technique. Trainees can alter lifting performance simply by adjusting technique. A trainee may be able to lift more weight immediately if they change to a biomechanically more efficient technique. However, this may not necessarily increase stress to the target muscle. So even though more load or more reps were performed, it doesn't mean our muscles are getting bigger or that the stimulus is more effective. All that it means is that we change technique to take advantage of biomechanical levers. For example, a trainee may be able to improve lifting performance of a lat pulldown by leaning back and swinging to use momentum compared with using a strict technique. This doesn't mean the trainee has all of a sudden grown their back muscles, and it doesn't mean they are providing more stress to the back muscles. In fact, the stress on the target muscle is probably worse despite the increase in performance. Ideally, trainees want to use a technique which maximizes stress on the target muscle, not a technique that allows you to lift the most weight. Therefore, we can't fully quantify stress using only reps and load. Another variable which will influence lifting performance, but isn't indicative of stress, is lifting tempo. This refers to the speed or duration of each repetition during an exercise. Tempo can influence lifting performance without necessarily increasing muscle stress. For example, a trainee can perform a bench press with a fast bounce at the bottom of the lift, or with a controlled tempo for the entire repetition. 
With a fast tempo at the bottom range, the trainee will take advantage of the stretch shortening cycle and probably be able to lift more weight or perform more reps. However, this doesn't mean that the stress on the chest is greater, it just means that tempo was faster. In fact, stress to the chest fibers will probably be greater using a more controlled tempo with a lighter load. Another factor influencing performance without direct impact on stress is rest periods. If rest periods are longer, then performance will be greater on subsequent sets. If rest periods are shorter, performance will be inhibited. So if we rest longer between sets and perform more reps, this doesn't mean we have increased muscle size or applied true progressive overload. It just means we dropped more fatigue between sets, which allowed us to perform better. In opposition, if a trainee has limited time to train on a particular day and shortens their rest period slightly, they probably won't be able to perform as well as usual. This is not an indicator of muscle loss or a non-productive workout, it just means they didn't have as much time to rest. Another factor influencing lifting performance and rate of progression is the novelty of the exercise. Strength is not only influenced by muscle size, but also by neural efficiency. When a trainee introduces a new exercise into their program, or an exercise they haven't performed for a while, they will initially see rapid improvements in lifting performance. These initial improvements primarily come from neural adaptations rather than muscle growth. And the last primary factor which may influence performance without necessarily influencing muscle stress is readiness and motivation. Naturally, we feel more or less excited and motivated to train on different days. Some days we may feel tired due to external stress or poor sleep, and we aren't as ready to push hard in the gym. Other days we feel great, take some pre-exercise caffeine, and feel pumped for our session. As a result, we may see performance fluctuations from session to session. Generally, our performance is more likely to be better when our readiness is greater, and performance is likely to be worse when readiness is lower. Once again, this is not indicative of muscle adaptations, it is just from short-term fluctuations in motivation and readiness. So as we can see, muscle growth doesn't have a direct correlation with lifting performance. So progressive overload can't be entirely quantified using lifting performance in the specific case for hypertrophy training. Rather, progressive overload is actually muscle stress, which makes it very difficult to actually measure and quantify. In fact, it is almost impossible to quantify and compare because there are so many different ways to apply muscle stress, which aren't numerically equivalent. However, lifting performance can be a good general indicator of muscle growth from a long-term perspective. Although there are many variables that can cause fluctuations in lifting performance from session to session and from week to week, we can use performance over a larger time scale to assess muscle growth. If a trainee is lifting more weight or more reps with the same strict technique, from month to month or year to year, then there is a good chance they are growing the prime movers of that lift. We also need to establish the concept of overloading training and how this differs from progressive overload. Like we discussed, progressive overload refers to a gradual increase in training difficulty over time. However, overloading training refers to the threshold required for adaptation to occur. Basically, there is a minimum and maximum threshold of training that can be considered overloading. If we train within these thresholds, then this is sufficient for adaptation to occur. If we don't train hard enough, it won't be enough stress to induce adaptation. And if we train way too hard, then it may be too much to recover from and we won't induce adaptation either. However, there is a large range of overloading training. This means hypertrophy can be achieved anywhere within this overloading range. However, the magnitude of stress we provide will determine the rate of adaptation. Training at the lower end of this range will result in a slower rate of muscle growth, while training at the higher end of this range will result in a faster rate of growth. In relation to hypertrophy training, training stress will be determined by factors like volume, proximity to failure, exercise selection, technique, and more. These are the variables that will influence the rate at which we make hypertrophy gains. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.